Hello and welcome to the eighth webinar of the Engineering Rising to the Challenge Initiative from Purdue Engineering. Uh, my name is Arvind Raman. I'm the Executive Associate Dean and the College of Engineering. Now, this initiative started in May 2020, uh, partly in response to the National Academy of Engineering's call to action uh, for engineers to tackle some of the challenges posed by the COVID-19 crisis. Um, but our initiative also looks to the longer term future uh, to rethink and re-engineer the very systems that our modern society has come to depend on um, so that they might be more resilient to such shocks in the future uh, while also serving society better. Uh, now, part of the initiative involves webinars where distinguished panelists unpack some of these challenges and provide us a glimpse into what the future might look like. Uh, and today's webinar's topic is how will data science and artificial intelligence reshape the post-pandemic future of healthcare, a really important and timely topic um, in these times. Uh, and I'd like to introduce uh, the moderator for today's panel, uh, Professor Guang Lin. Uh, Guang Lin is an associate professor in the School of Mechanical Engineering and the Department of Mathematics at Purdue University. Uh, Professor Lin is a director of Data Science Consulting Service that performs cutting edge research on data science and provides hands-on consulting support for data analysis and business analytics in all areas to overcome data science challenges arising in research, education, business, and organizational management. His research interests include diverse topics uh, in computational and data science, both in algorithms and applications. His main current thrust is in machine learning, data-driven modeling, uh, stochastic simulation, and multi-scale modeling of interconnected physical and biological systems. Professor Lin is currently a member of uh, Purdue Engineering Initiative on data and engineering applications. Uh, Professor Lin uh, has been widely recognized for his scholarship. Uh, he has received various awards such as the National Science Foundation Career Award, uh, the Mid-Career Sigma Psi Award, uh, the University Faculty Scholar, uh, Mathematical Biosciences Institute Early Career Award, and the Ronald Brodzinski Award for Early Career Exceptional Achievement. Uh, over to you, Guan. Thank you. Thanks, Arin, for the introduction. So let me share the screen. First of all, click the share. So we're going to have the share screen. So OK, let me do the first screen mode. OK, so hello, everyone. So it's a great honor. So we uh, I moderate this uh, webinar on how weather science and AI shape the post-pandemic future of healthcare. It's a great honor. We have five uh, distinguished uh, panelists from various backgrounds. Uh, so let me introduce the first panelist. It's uh, Johanno uh, Kuluciano. Johanno received the PhD degree in electrical computer engineering in 2004 from John Hopkins University. Since uh, July 2019, Johanno works as a fellow at Micron. He was an associate professor of the School of Electrical and uh, Computer Engineering and uh, the Weldon School of Biomedical Engineering and the School of Mechanical Engineering and of uh, Psychology Science in the College of Health, Human Science at the Purdue University. Where he directed the eLab, his research focus is uh, in artificial vision system, deep learning, hardware acceleration of vision algorithms, Johanna is the recipient of the Presidential Early Career Award of Science and Engineering, we call it PKs, and the Distinguished Lecture of the IEEE. In 2013, Johanna found the TerraDeep, a company focused on the design of deep neural network processors. In 2016, Johanna founded uh, the Forward Next to de deliver the next generation synthetic brains for artificial intelligence acquired by the Micron. So the second panelist is uh, Mario uh, Wancheska. Mario is current an associate professor of uh, industry engineering at uh, Purdue University. His uh, broad interests generally fall in the area of uh, computational science and engineering and uh, across multi application domains. Prior to join Purdue, he held a postdoc positions at the University of Toronto and the Cambridge, which followed the completion of his PhD in system design engineering from University of Waterloo. His undergrad and master degrees are in computer science from Brock and uh, Guelph University respectively. 
So the third panelist is uh, Mona Flores. Mona is the global head of medical AI at NVIDIA. She brings a unique perspective with her uh, variety of expertise in the clinical medicine, uh, medical application, and business. She is a broad uh, certified uh, cardiac surgeon and uh, the previous chief medical officer of a digital health company. She holds an MBA in management information systems and has worked on Wall Street. Her ultimate goal is the betterment of medicine through AI. My other panelist is Tanya Pujo. Tanya is an assistant professor in the School of Industry Engineering at uh, uh, Purdue University. Her PhD is uh, in industry engineering from the Georgia Tech with a concentration in statistics and a minor in biomedical informatics. Her doctor research focused on analytics and machine learning applied to health data. She leverages methods from data science, statistics, and the network science with application to various uh, populations, include uh, pregnant women, infants, and uh, chronic optic users. She is an awardee of a National Institute of Health Training grant and the Alfred Sloan Scholar Fellow, and has uh, received various uh, other awards, including from post sessions and uh, informs. During her PhD, she also had the opportunity to serve as uh, a visiting scholar at Harvard Medical School in the healthcare policy department, where she completed research in castle inference. So my last panelist is uh, Yao Shen Chen, as the director of vaccine modeling team at uh, Economic Data Service of the Center for Observational and Real World Evidence within Merck Research Laboratory. Dr. Chen constructs, calibrates, and validates sophisticated infectious disease models that integrate both clinical trial and the real world data. Dr. Chen's major technical responsibilities include applying modeling techniques to evaluate uh, health economic impact of uh, various vaccine strategies, as well as to inform indication site selection for vaccine clinical trial planning. Since joining Merck nearly three years ago, Dr. Chen has led the development of analytical modeling activities for, for vaccines. So that's include COVID-19 as well. So let's welcome the four panelists. So today the topic will be the how will data science and AI shape the post-pandemic future of health. So the 2020 pandemic has challenged our healthcare system, but it has also opened the door to a greater acceptance of the virtual clinical visit and AI enabled automation. So what will the future of healthcare look like in the AI era and how did the science and AI will shape the post-pandemic future of healthcare? So today's topic is also related to two of the initiatives that's going on at the College of Engineering. One is the initiative in data engineering applications that uh, myself and uh, Mario are part of uh, this initiative. And the other is initiative is uh, the initiative in the engineering medicine. So today, the first, the following, we're gonna talk about uh, some, uh, addressing some important topics related to this uh, future, how the AI and the data science gonna affect the future post-pandemic healthcare. So the topic one, uh, want to address is uh, how AI and the data science can help with uh, vaccine discovery, clinical trial, and the vaccination implementation planning. So Yaoxuan, can you help address this topic? Sure, I just want to test, can I, am I, do I sound okay? Yes. Yes, okay, I see Tong Yang is nodding her head, thank you. <laughs> so before attempting to answer this quite rich and complex questions, let me try to briefly give an overview of my work related specifically to these questions. So my work in the vaccine modeling team at the Center of Observational and Real World Evidence within the Merck Research Laboratories is mainly we construct and validate very sophisticated models. Some will call it AI model, some will call it infectious disease models. I think those terms can be understood interchangeably in a relaxed manner. So we, we construct this kind of models for vaccines that integrate both 
clinical trial data as well as the real world patients behavior data into the models. And within my company, the models we constructed are later usually applied to evaluate economy and health impact of various vaccines and their vaccination strategy implementations in the countries that we identify as a key market. And sometimes, sometimes these kind of models will also be used to inform the vaccine trial indications as well as the site selection for the purpose of uh, planning large scale trials in the midst of a lot of uncertainty. Uh, for example, in the COVID-19 outbreak where one can really know which outbreak will be or how large it will be. And before joining Merck, where I work right now, I actually work at the US Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. Part of my job there at the time was to apply this relevant and similar modeling uh, techniques to assist the agency's public health emergency outbreak response. And I have where well, was involved in a various of, uh, I would say disease outbreak that including Ebola pandemic influenza planning, as well as HIV outbreak that happened um, back in Indiana in 2016, I believe. So I actually give a very short answer to the questions that uh, Guan just proposed is like how AI and data science can help with vaccine discovery, clinical trials and vaccination implementation planning. My short answer is that it is actually a very challenging process from the discovery uh, proof it's, and also attempting to prove its efficacy while designing a large scale. When, when we say large scale, it's like 20,000 to 60,000 subject experiment to show its efficacy. Uh, Operation because people country in different world. This whole process is full of risk and uncertainties. I think how we can AI and data is that we can work with researchers, clinicians, operators closely to help them filter through a lot of their concerns, uh, problems, and listen to them carefully and apply our techniques to help them identify the key problems to focus on, and then apply our techniques to help them build an understandable tools for them to make sure that they can be used in the real world setting, settings to find the right solutions to the problems that concern them the most. So that's. Okay, yeah. So Yaoshen, yeah, thanks a lot for your uh, yeah, insightful uh, addressing this uh, topic one. So let's uh, addressing uh, the topic two. The topic two is uh, how AI and uh, the data science uh, can help on the healthcare policy decision making. So Tonya, can you help on this topic? Yeah, thank you. So um, going with my research, a lot of it focuses on using claims data, um, medical claims data for, uh, for this implication for how can we improve policy or understand what's going on at a population health level. So um, I often mention uh, in a lot of my talks and to people that um, data science is becoming more and more important within healthcare. And one of the reasons really is that healthcare data is expected to grow faster than any other sector. And that includes uh, all types of data, right? When we're talking about healthcare data, we're working with EHR data, we're working with these medical claims data, we're working with image data, we're working with biometrics data from wearables, right? So this brings us um, a lot of information where we can start to understand um, a patient and understand uh, what the implications and impact of policy can be on these um, health outcomes from this data, and also how equitable the implementation of some policy can be. And that includes 
uh, looking at policy affecting different subpopulations, such as vulnerable populations, and understanding any heterogeneous effects even within those subpopulations. And having really large data allows us to do that because we're able to, um, we have enough data on all these subpopulations to really be able to assess these things, right? So um, in addition on this is um, there's all of this new health IT legislation, legislation that's coming out that's really pushing for this interoperability so that um, we can really look at data from different providers and bring it together or from um, when a patient moves across to uh, different insurance companies. And a lot of times we're limited and we can't get a full picture of a patient because we are limited by, okay, we have data from a certain set of providers. So if this person goes to a different provider, we can't see what's happening there, or we only have it from a certain insurance company. So when they go to a different insurance company or their insurance changes, we also lose that data. So um, these, uh, these also initiatives that are happening in policy will allow us to uh, get more longitudinal studies, get a fuller picture of what's going on with the patient, as well as uh, for these population studies. And then as well as this interoperability will really help uh, other groups. Uh, ideally, it will help other groups really assess this type of data. So more people can really look at this and more people can do analysis and look at these impacts given right now, normally, it, it is only larger corporations or really well-resourced universities that have access to this data to be able to do these really uh, this really good policy work. Um, on more of the technology side, um, this data also, um, what, what we can, for again, looking at policy, this can help with, um, when we're looking at AI or data science, it can really help with technology solutions that can improve healthcare for time-constrained clinicians. Um, I've heard of, you know, solutions where you can create, um, computer programs that can really assist with care, such as um, explaining different contraception options to women or explaining maternal risk factors. And this um, helps low income populations as well as um, not even that, but just you know, really supplement that 10 minutes you may get with the um, physician given how time constraints they are. And this can really help with implementation um, by allowing for, you know, screening or allowing for faster implementation of healthcare policy recommendations and making them more feasible. And it also helps with the easier information dissemination of these new policies. So I think these are the uh, forefront of things that are coming up and how we can continue to really use this, uh, use data science and um, AI to really help with policy, not just decision making, which we get from the data, but also better implementation for, um, for policy. Okay, yeah. Yeah, thanks a lot, Tanya. So yeah, let's move to, from the high level policy, let's move to the topic three. It's about how medical AI and the digital health will reshape healthcare systems after the pandemic. So we would like to invite Mona to address this question. So Mona gonna share the screen, so I'm gonna quit sharing. So Mona, you are muted. Can you unmute yourself? Yes. Okay, yes. sure. Let me share my screen for a sure. second. Uh, and you should be able to see uh, Dr. Lin now. Are you able to see Dr. Lin? Or uh, actually yeah, all of I us? Think it's maybe yes. another, another screen, right? Uh, yeah, yeah, no, yeah. That, that's actually, uh, I think, what, what are you seeing now? Uh, I'm seeing uh, everybody. The, the, yeah, that's yeah. what you should be seeing. Okay, great, mm -hmm. perfect. So let's just, uh, and now you should see the NVIDIA screen and we can yep. go to the next one. Perfect. Uh, so thanks again, Gong, uh, for this question. I think it's a very important question is what, what is, um, how, how is uh, AI and digital health shaping our healthcare, uh, especially after this pandemic? So the pandemic has caused a fundamental shift in healthcare delivery from new ways of doing old things to creating new things altogether. Uh, as I see it, there are a few different ways in which medical AI and digital health is going to change healthcare. Bear with me as I go through them. Uh, and we're gonna go through each panel of the slide to illustrate uh, each one of these ways. So let's start with virtual visits. Uh, they are the new way of conducting the old fashioned doctor's visit, the old true and tried way. Virtual visits have increased 10 to 15 times from pre-pandemic levels. And I think they're going uh, to stay. 
why? Um, one, because patients, for the most part, like visiting with their doctors from the comfort of their own homes. It's easier. They don't have to disrupt their schedules. And because CMS, the Center for Medicare and Medicaid Services, is now even reimbursing for these visits, uh, making them on par uh, in terms of reimbursement with physical visits. So the incentives are there. But besides video consults, we now also have an increase in telework. And not just for office workers, but for radiologists, for pathologists, they can now read studies from home. Um, for sure, again, we have more incentives for televisits and for telework, but, but that is not the whole story. The, the reason this is going to stay is because it is now easier and you can do this uh, in a much more straightforward fashion. Uh, AI played a part here by enhancing the connectivity platforms that allow the, this telework and televisits by providing transcription and translation services, video compression, noise can cancellation, uh, even the wearables that allow this uh, doctor patient visit where the doctor has access to all of the vitals uh, because of the wearables the patient has. So let's now look at the second panel here and look at NLP natural language processing and how that made it possible for all kinds of chatbots and AI virtual assistants, uh, like Misty here, the blue uh, NVIDIA avatar that uh, we use for conversational AI. Today, there are chatbots for checking symptoms, chatbots for answering medical questions, for scheduling visits. Uh, we have bots for mental health and ones for billing questions. All of these are made possible by deep learning and new language models. Uh, and then digital health uh, and AI has also made it possible to have remote patient monitoring. This is the last panel on the top, uh, whether it's in the hospital room or at home. Now you have technology that can check on patients, transmit their vitals, remind them to take their meds and send alerts when bad things are about to happen. Uh, fourth, there are new ways to develop medical algorithms in the rush to develop models uh, from diagnostics to risk factor modeling to triage algorithms. Uh, it became apparent that we need more data and we need more diverse data to make our models more robust and more generalizable. Federated learning is a distributed way to train algorithms without sharing data. Now data scientists and clinicians in Wuhan and Indiana can collaborate on training an AI model without ever having to share the data. And the resulting model is actually uh, a, a better model and will work at both places. Federated learning adoption is increasing and very recently the FDA even announced that it is evaluating the use of federated learning in its regulatory approval process. How about medical devices? Newer medical devices are now emerging to fill the need for smarter, smaller, and more mobile devices. Uh, whether it is a mobile MRI scanner, an autonomous ultrasound, or a faster PET scanner, all of these devices are now made possible and made, made, made better by software, by software that writes software, and essentially by AI. They are becoming software defined. And at last, let's look at, uh, at drug discovery. Um, it, it used to take 10 to 12 years to develop a drug or vaccine, and Dr. Chen here is, is probably working for Merck is very aware of this. Well, no more. Again, the COVID vaccine, or vaccines, I should say, took less than a year to develop. AI created a time machine for drug discovery, from accelerated sequencing and molecular dynamic applications to better simulation. Pharma essentially had a wake-up call, and this is just the beginning. Precision medicine is no longer a pipe dream it will be a reality in the not too distant future. So these are the ways that I see uh, AI and digital health changing healthcare. Again, I just wish this did not take a pandemic to get us here. Yeah, Mona, thanks a lot for this uh, overview. I think it's just very, uh, very helpful for us better understand how AI can help. Um, okay, so let me share the screen again. So let me click. So, okay, let me see. Uh, let me stop sharing. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. Let me see. Okay. So, all right. So let's uh, continue to the topic four. The topic four will be how AI enabled the uh, medical device and uh, machine learning can change the healthcare after a pandemic. So, Johanna, can you help to address this topic? Oh yes. Uh, hi everyone. Uh, it's nice to nice to see you here despite uh, this COVID here. Uh, 
it's a pleasure also to, to be in this panel uh, with uh, su such great panelists. And um, I have to thank you, Dr. Flores, because <laughs> she basically <laughs> painted a, a really good picture of um, um, a lot of what uh, I think AI and devices uh, is, are going to be um, in, in the next few years. So, so and uh, I want to I iterate a few of these topics because I, I think they're they're quite dear to me, and um, I think probably we'll we'll discuss more in in this panel. First of all, I think one of the major challenges I think that we have is is really how to share uh, medical data, uh, even anonymized medical data um, across the board. I think really, really this is the biggest problem here to, to create uh, successful algorithms and devices as well <clears throat> that, can, uh, that, that can really make a difference. Um, and um, yeah, I'm sure we'll, we'll talk more about the topic. Um, but yeah, when you think about uh, medical enabled AI or medical devices, uh, I think uh, uh, many of you might, uh, might be thinking of uh, wearable devices that, that can monitor you uh, at, at home or at the comfort of your home. Or even during this pandemic, right? At, at the end of the day, uh, before the vaccine or or, or other um, or other help, I would I would think that you know maybe people were even a little bit scared of uh, going to to an health center, and so they definitely welcome uh, remote remote monitoring or, uh, or remote diagnosis, and even uh, patients that. Um, uh, that, that were affected by the disease, I would think that there are uh, many long-term um, effects that can be studied, but it's really hard to start with the, with the current system that we have. So I think really what we need is something that can uh, monitor a patient at home over a long time. Uh, so, you know, we've all been dreaming for years of these uh, fancy medical devices that would uh, uh, you know, like a wearable bracelet uh, or or something that would would track uh, all your vitals. But uh, unfortunately, they're not really here yet, and probably a lot of it has to do with the fact that uh, it's difficult to interface, still difficult to interface uh, medical devices with the human body for an overextended period of times. Uh, and so, I think, uh, um, you know, because I worked uh, a lot on um, on cameras and monitoring. Um, I always bring this to uh, uh, some, some project that we, you know, even a research project that we uh, were planning almost 20 years ago, which is uh, monitoring people at home with, uh, with standard camera networks, for example. And I know some people uh, are really concerned about privacy, but I think that can be dealt um, uh, quite easily. But um, if, even if you think of uh, long-term monitoring at home, uh, this is a non-invasive system uh, well, let's say privacy <laughs> without considering privacy, <laughs> not invasive, but it, it's a system that uh, makes it easy to, uh, to look at the behavior of people even living alone. Um, and um, imagine uh, a camera can really notice uh, subtle move, changes of movements or routines um, or, or changes that affect your behavior, your mobility. Um, and uh, a, lot, a lot of people are, are concerned because they think of camera just like the one you're seeing now, right? I'm streaming over the internet to who knows how many people, right? Uh, and so if there's something behind me, okay, I'm in trouble. But um, a lot of these things can be, I think it can be mitigated because um, uh, with the use of AI and especially at the edge um, servers at home, you could really concealing you can really conceal all, all the video streams and just extract information uh, purely. So I'm, I'm really in favor of, of a system like this um, for, a, for a variety of things, and especially also for general care in, in general. Right? So I, I think that's uh, one of my biggest bet. And uh, I wish you all a great year and uh, let's continue the discussion. Thank you. Thank you, Juan. Yeah, thank you. So let's uh, continue move on to the topic five. So we're gonna look into how our data and the complex system science change what we demand our modeling tools and the, the role in policy decisions and the healthcare infrastructures. So Mario. Thanks, Kwong. Um, so first, as the previous panelists have um, definitely um, brought up, the data science side of things has become much more rich lately. 
um, exponential growth of data, many more different kinds of sensors, and COVID has definitely made a lot of the need for these to be more obvious, um, and we'll definitely be seeing an increased growth in that aside from what we've already seen. Uh, the complex system side, um, I'll, I'll introduce a little bit. Um, and if you look at the world around you, you actually see that everything is really what we call a complex system on some level. Um, and this deals roughly with systems that have many different pieces. And these pieces interact with each other according to some rules, which we may or may not be aware of, um, but we can maybe model in a probabilistic sense. And as these different components of the system interact, they give rise to the overall system behavior. And sometimes that system has uh, uh, statistical properties that are relatively consistent, sometimes not, um, but usually there's an unpredictable nature to the overall system behavior, even if we know uh, with a pretty good resolution what the individual components are doing. And if you look, this, this kind of a system exists on very small levels like proteins, as well as very large levels like um, the global uh, social network that we see either online or, or in reality as we interact with different people. And so the work I've been doing is uh, in this area with respect to um, disease mitigation and so on is to construct models of social networks. Uh, these are real world social networks, not online social networks uh, for the purpose of understanding how people interact because a lot of those interactions uh, could lead to disease spread. And if we can understand that overall network, we could potentially uh, integrate data about those people to understand policies that are able to mitigate the disease more effectively than some of the uh, broad heuristics that we typically use. And this is where I think there's uh, a lot of potential still going forward. Traditional models for disease spread tend to be focused on very high level understanding of things. So they may model the entire country's global or uh, spread or even globally as a differential equation. And so that's a very, very rough approximation in terms of what actually happens. But it can still be useful, again, if you want to answer very high level questions. As we get more information of individuals and how they interact with each other, and as we have more computational power to be able to process it, we can create more rich models of those systems, which allow us then to create more granular policies to understand things at a more local level, which can help us be more effective and efficient in detecting uh, potential outbreaks or to make policies that are more tuned to specific kinds of communities, geographically spread or otherwise, um, that we can more effectively use our resources, stop the disease spread and so on. And um, I think we're just at an early place in these kinds of roles, um, in these kinds of uh, technologies. Um, as we get more data, and I said we can get much more granular in terms of how we see the world. And with resources, especially monetary resources becoming much more scarce, I think there's a huge opportunity to be using such tools. Um, again, keeping even the same amount of resources, but being much more effective going forward. Yeah, yeah exactly. I think uh, right now during this pandemic, we collect uh, all kinds of data, right? Such as the uh, social distancing and the contact tracing, all these kind of data was uh, make it public available, right? So I think Google also generated a lot of data, right? For the, con for the contact tracing, right? Other stuff. So how are we gonna utilize this data to make a better model? I think that will be a very interesting, right? Also bring up a, a big data challenge, right? How do we utilize AI to do that? Yeah, definitely just to jump in and pick up on that is uh, you can mix, for example, the machine learning and stuff that all the other panelists have been talking about with complex systems to mm -hmm. even automatically generate these policies or at least potential policies for the policy experts to consider in a way that um, may highlight non-trivial solutions. Um, but when they do see them, they're like, oh, wow, this is uh, a really good way to do this, um, but it would be very difficult to otherwise have thought about just because of the data explosion and the fact that our brains can only handle so much information, especially when it gets in a very large scale and a very dynamic environment. So it's a good point. Yeah, exactly. I think also, uh, you think about like New York City, right? They have a lot of uh, street cameras, right? Uh, to monitoring the traffic, right? So in the meantime, you also know, looking at the, the, the passengers, right? You can check whether how many people wearing masks, right? So all this information you can uh, post process and you can get a sense in the whole city, how many people wearing masks, right? So whether you need to mandate some policy to enforce that, right? So I think that will give you some real time feedback. I think it will be a very interesting. So I think now it's uh, the time. I think we can uh, move on to the real time uh, question. The audience can uh, post your questions. Uh, if, if you would like to uh, ask, right? So you can post it through the chat. So we will address your questions. So 
Okay, so right now you have to post the, uh, oh, so, so uh, Jacob, I think uh, that's uh, someone asked, uh, uh, the Jacob Stevens, right, asked a question to Johanna about uh, is current uh, HW capability uh, capable of uh, uh, provides useful AI enabled medical device that are either internal to the body or affixed to the body or do we still need further improvements to enable their level to monitoring? Johanna? Can you address that? You're, you're mute. Yes, yeah, yeah. Thank you for the question, uh, Jacob. Um, yeah, so um, I think, you know, we already have uh, some of these devices. I think uh, probably Apple has been spearheading them. Uh, we have the Apple Apple Watch that can do some, some monitoring for the masses. And uh, also a lot of us are carrying cell phones all the time. And so even those can, uh, I can really take lots of uh, lots of measurement. I think uh, um, of you know how our daily routine and behavior much more than uh, probably we're willing to give give away um, as easily. Um, and I think uh, in in the future there'll there'll be more uh, there'll be more of these devices. The question it has to do with uh, uh, you know with how you you interface. You know for for example even. Um, uh, blood glucose levels would be really useful if they could be monitored all the time. But, uh, um, you know, again, we have a, there might be issues there with the uh, uh, chronic monitoring, right? That, that it's, it's, hard to, it's hard to do. Um, that, but if somebody has a pacemaker, uh, yeah, that definitely I'm sure that um, that device can also be monitored um, externally, even, you know, in line through some cell phone or or something else. And again, here we have uh, uh, a few a few issues that I guess you know probably the panel is gonna is gonna talk about even more. Is that one of them is uh, security? You know, are all these devices secure um, to the point that uh, definitely we don't have uh, interference with uh, um, with anyone ex external, right? And, and the second thing is also uh, is is the the data protected even when it's extracted from this device and eventually probably makes its way uh, to a cloud. Uh, is this data pro protected? And at the very least, it could be de anonymized, and so that um, um, uh, in some cases, you know, uh, if, even if you have the data, you don't necessarily are able to trace it back to a, a particular individual. Uh, but these are tricky, tricky things because, like for example, location data that some a lot of our cell phones capture can actually be traced back to a person, even if it's anonymized. Uh, so we gotta be careful about things like that. I would say, yeah. Thank you for the question. Yeah, it's a very good question. So, yeah, thanks, Johanna, for addressing this. So one follow-up question by Shurusi. Uh, she asked, uh, "How will AI and the data science affect the way clinical studies are conducted post-pandemic?" So, Mario, uh, who feel comfortable? Um, I think this may be more up to the clinical people. So maybe Mona or Yashin. Yeah, oh, Yashin. I, I can, I can okay, actually. Sure. I, I, mm -hmm. I think Dr. Chen is probably better mm -hmm. for answering this, but I'll just take a jab at it. Okay. Uh, I, I think one, one of the things that we're going to be able to, uh, we, with seeing uh, today is using uh, AI, using NLP to, for cohort creation. Uh, for clinical trials. So you can imagine uh, now we can comb through uh, the records, uh, unstructured records, uh, uh, progress notes from the physicians and figure out um, who, who we might, who might, we might be able to recruit for a, for a clinical trial. Uh, and the other thing, you know, the other aspect of it that with the new wearables and, and new miniaturized lab tests that you can do at home, you know, there's machines today that, you know, at, with a little uh, uh, chip on a cartridge, you're able to do, uh, get your white blood cell count at home. Uh, so you can imagine if you have a drug for chemotherapy and you're following white blood cell counts, now you're able to do that again, the same way we do it for Coumadin, you know, you, you don't have to go to, to the lab to do this, especially if you're immunocompromised. Uh, you can get uh, measurements of other biomarkers uh, right from your own house. Um, I, I don't know, Dr. Chen, do you, do you have anything to add to this? I like your answer, Mona. And I also want to point out that 
when this question is posed, my first questions to the question is that clean, clinical studies for what? Are they going to be clinical studies for vaccines or for drugs or for medical device? Because these three different kind of types of um, medical, I would say, instruments have very different, uh, it's very a different level regulatory requirement. So the point that Eugene pointed out earlier about the sharing of data has been a kind of a key, because AI and data science rely on data to in, bring out the insights that these studies can reveal. But the, the regulators around the data itself for either vaccine or drugs or medical device are very different. And so whether post pandemic period will change the clinical studies conducted with the, with the help of AI and data science, I will say a partially yes to some uh, perhaps medical device, but for vaccines, I, I have some reservation there that I feel it was it's gonna to be as rigid as it has been because of a lot of issues we see in the society about vaccine hesitancy. Yeah. Okay. Okay, yeah, this is very helpful. So as we had got another question by Andre, I, I think she asked uh, a question. So why is uh, interoperability such a big challenge? Uh, what are some steps to make data sharing more effective and easier? So yeah, Tonya, do you think you feel comfortable addressing yeah. this? Yeah, I can talk to this and I think Mona probably has some um, uh -huh. things to add as well. So um, one of the big things, it's a vendor, you know, lock-in, right? So um, a specific HR company will, will, do, will do their best, right, from the company perspective to make their data not operable with other EHRs, right, which, which makes sense from a business perspective. But from a researcher perspective, then it makes it difficult to, you know, compare that data across, you um, different providers or across um, like different um, different types of vendors, right? So that's that's um, one in, interoperability aspect. And then also, again, I was kind of uh, mentioned before when you're looking at this claims data versus this, um, versus again, this EHR data, right? Like how are we able to really bring this data together so that we're able to get a fuller picture, right? Because the claims data is what we're sending to the insurance company and what information we have um, in terms of what was done, but we're not getting those clinical notes. We're not getting the responses to, you know, the results to test or labs and being able to bring that data together um, is not done right now. Some of it is due to, um, restrictions, but um, some of it is just due to it doesn't um, work between the different types of codes and systems. So that's the type of interoperability issues that come up. There's also the issue of just a lot of data bringing this, uh, you know, EHR data, bringing this digitization to healthcare is somewhat new, right? So, so how are you able to bring these old systems up to speed also in a way that is usable for, you know, data science as well as AI? Um, and, um, and being able to, again, when you bring it up to speed in a way that is uniform so that all of it can be brought together to see the full picture. Um, so those are the, the challenges in terms of steps uh, to make it easier. Uh, that's kind of what policy is looking at now, right? How can we really approach interoperability in a way that is, um, that is useful, right? Um, and then, um, and so that even a patient can understand their data from all different providers as well. Um, Mona, I don't know if you wanna add more to this no, as well. I I, I, th I think that that's exactly right. M maybe one th one part of the question was uh, why why is it so important? Why is interoperability such a big big challenge? Um, and well, you know, as, as as Toya said, there's just many different systems. A lot of the systems don't talk to each other. You go to one hospital where you had a CT scan. You go to another hospital, they can't access it. You sometimes have to repeat the study. Um, and you know, there's also different ontologies. We we call things differently. Someone might call it a blood test. Someone might call it a um, you know a lab test. You know, it's just simplifying it. Uh, and and as you can imagine, if you really want to use want to Play with data science, and you want to develop models. You you need a lot of data, and, and that data needs you know you need to make sure that you're collecting similar data from 
or, or the same entities. You know, if, I, if I'm looking uh, to the creatinine level, I, I have to make sure that it is the actual, the same creatinine level that I'm looking for at every different hospital, right? Uh, so if, if there is no way to assure that, you know, the data is uniform, uh, at least in the way we refer to this data and in the way we access it, it's hard to train these models. Yes. Mm -hmm. So yeah, very, very good. So let's look at another, uh, I think it related to question. So I think uh, Christian, I think uh, asked the question is uh, interoperability, is that the only issue? How about the HIPAA? Uh, so issues that are mandated by law or is it by something else? So Tanya? Uh, um, so, I mean, there, there, interoperability is one issue, right? Um, mm -hmm. Which I, I wouldn't say it's the only issue. Um, the the data is sometimes not great, right? Like in all sorts of data, especially big data, you there's cleaning, there's you know things that are misentered, there's um, physician bias, there's you know some physicians just prefer using some codes versus other codes, right? And so those are the type of problems that you run into when um, working with um, with this type of data. How do you really take into account these uh, you know these these differences for these uh, inputs that are given by humans, right? Um, in terms of being HIPAA compliant, um, this we kind of discussed offline as uh, the panelist looking at privacy, right? And um, and I think what we're learning um, in other privacy spaces uh, is sometimes the current laws for de-identification probably are no longer strong enough. Um, uh, a study came out a few years ago from this uh, CS professor from Imperial College London, and he really found that just being able to take de-identified credit card information and link it with uh, spatial temporal data, he was able to identify 90% of like this 1.1 million people data set. And so that's really, uh, I think the next real stage of um, challenges when we're looking at HIPAA or this de-identification and privacy is as we start to get more data sets, uh, one data set, you may not be able to identify that person, but what happens when we start linking that to all these other data sets? And then, you know, this person is no longer anonymous. You're able to learn a lot about them, right? And how do we protect against that? And, but also on the other side, we do want researchers to be able to use this data. And we want this information for researchers to be able to move forward and do all these great things with it. So, so that's really a balance of, you know, supporting research as well as protecting privacy. Um, I think that that's a really interesting question that's gonna be coming up for a while. Yeah, there has to be a balance, right? Okay, so Mario, do you want to uh, add additional comments? Um, I, th I think there's one that's um, next that I think it would be good for me to kind of mix that together. Um, uh, okay, sure. Mona or Yashin or Eugenio jump in if they want to add. Uh, okay, let me read the next question. So the next question is about uh, end of the COVID-19 situation. So which kind of data are most in need uh, and uh, collected for policymaking? And the second question is, so what is the biggest blind spot of spread modeling that uh, policymakers feel uncomfortable? So Mario, you can start first. Sure, so um, the work I've done with COVID has been both in Canada and the United States um, and there's slightly different social dynamics that happen in each one. Um, primarily in the US, I'd say the contact tracing has been the one that the policy people and, and health people are most asking for as far as the data because that gives us an insight in terms of what's really happening and how the disease is spreading. And so while we have you know, so many hundreds of thousands of uh, pieces of data coming in a day on that, it's not enough to be able to really understand that spread, which means the kinds of policies that we can find that could potentially help mitigate the disease aside from wearing masks, which is pretty general, but more granular um, policies become very difficult to understand because we have this huge gap, this big blind spot in terms of where we should even be looking or, or um, uh, potentially even what kinds of, why, why they're not even reporting and uh, what kinds of policies would be more effective for those kinds of communities. Um, again, we need to have the spotlight on, on the society as much as possible, um, which does bring in some questions, um, you know, going into the future in terms of data gathering on privacy and so on, but um, at least self-reporting contact tracing in the case of COVID is one that I know uh, both policy and health people are really um, yearning for and would be a huge help. Um, as far as the biggest blind spot um, on the spread modeling, um, and what makes people uncomfortable. I think, I don't know if uncomfortable is really the way I would look at it, but I think uh, 
especially comparing Canada and the US, um, I think the thing that policy people would like to see improved most is education and compliance. And so whatever we can do in the modeling side of things, the science side of things is great from a modeling and science perspective. But at the end of the day, if, even if we have the super most hyper accurate models possible um, and we come up with these really good policies, um, if the people that we're telling to follow these policies don't um, believe what we're saying or uh, just don't comply with them, then it doesn't really matter. And so the thing that I would say makes the policy side people more um, uncomfortable with the whole situation is that they're coming up with these great policies and they don't know how to tell people or to convince people that they really are the good policies and in a way that the people would actually follow them. Yeah, exactly. We, we may need some, like, uh, have some incentive, right, to encourage people to follow policy, right? So. Yeah, it's a, whether it's a incentives or whether it's um, just a better way of educating um, yeah. or okay. whether it's reaching out to different um, like media bubbles, whether it's online or whether it's in person or whether it's in print or whatever the case is, um, how to best communicate with different piece, people in the community um, in a way that they really understand and start to trust what's being told to them um, is a, a big gap right now. And I think if uh, and just comparing Canada and the US, which are not so different, um, there are um, big enough differences in the kind of natural inclination of the general public to abide by policies, um, even between neighboring countries. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So Yoshan, uh, do you want to add on some comments? Sure, I can. Uh, let's let me try to add some comments on the question number two, from the perspective of UK implementation. So in terms of the blind spot that uh, I fully agree from the UK perspective, there are various many good modelers trying to bring out the warning ahead of the say the the now famous UK variant strain circulating in the society back in uh, early November's time. But the government just put aside the scientist, scientist's advice and then keep pushing forward in hope to reboost the economy as much as possible. So for me, the biggest, biggest blind spot is sometimes not how advanced our work is or how accurate our data is, is that as a scientist, can we build up long-term relationship with those people who are making policy decisions either in the government or in the company that actually could accept the work we do, not take them as a, not, not consider our work as a black box and therefore have some doubts with the outcome that we generate. Educate education as well as uh, long-term co uh, correlation, co uh, collaboration with those decision makers is really important. Not our work is suspicious. It's just they need to understand in their own way. So that to me is the biggest blind spot, concur, uh, concurring what uh, Mario say. And in terms of the COVID situation, data needs the most for collection in for the policy making. I think you need to, uh, you need to, the, the needs change with time. In the beginning, it is the scale of the pandemic. In the middle of the pandemic, it is the, the potential in the midst of pandemic, when we see, for example, back in December and November's time when COVID was going, COVID cases are going down in Europe. At the time, the the understanding of how the inter, um, connection between countries, how importation of cases from other area could possibly come back. That that kind of data needs is more urgent. Right now, the data needs become the uh, implementation of vaccination, the speed of it, the effectiveness of it, and how it will help on top of the uh, social distancing policy we see already in place. So in a complex situation, there are, uh, as I mentioned earlier about vaccines, it is always important for us as scientists with modeling techniques to work with decision maker to understand the whole system that the ultimate with the ultimate goal to with the ultimate goal of eliminate, eliminating the disease. With those in mind, we need to identify the right problems at the right time so that our work can be truly trusted as a solution providers. Yep. 
Yeah, okay, Yaoxuan. Yeah, thanks for addressing. Yeah, man. So uh, Yaoxuan, uh, let me ask you, uh, yeah, since you're expert for the vaccine, right? So like, uh, so I think everybody here is also, audience also very interesting about the vaccine, uh, sorry for COVID vaccine, right? So my question is, uh, after the first shot, right, of a Pfizer vaccine, how long it take to take effect? How many days normally, do you know? If the first shot, then we need, I think it's <laughs> two weeks, we need to the, take the second shot, The problem right? is, the problem is there is no data to really no. just to really say anything about what they say in the label. Normally in the, in the normal time, a company will do a lot of rigorous ex, uh, experiments in their clinical trial, which compose of like at least 20 to 60,000 people. They need to design trial in order to understand the question you just raised, Guan, like mm -hmm. what is the right, what is the right efficacy? And then when we efficacy and duration and also intervals between doses. Right now, because of the emergency need, the clinical trial actually is designed in a specific way that they can only say there is 95% efficacy, not, not in terms of infection aversion, but it's actually in terms of decrease of severe cases in a 12 week interval. That specifically they say 12 week intervals, they will reach 95%. At anything, the, anything that uh, the UK, UK government as well as can, can, Canada government now trying to push out saying that because it's emergency cases, we should give the second dose in a delay time to a wider population so that everybody has first do dose and delay the second dose outside the 12 weeks recommendation. In the industry, they call it off-label use. And it's actually a murky zone to go into because we don't know, because th there, there's no clinical study conducted to understand off-label use efficacy. But, but public health concern and clinical studies approval, they are two different things. So no one can answer the questions right now. And people can just do some calculations smartly to come up with their own interpretation of the data. But those interpretation will never be accepted at the regula regulatory agency, including FDA or uh, European medis medical agencies. So vaccine development till the approval process itself is interconnected and it's very complex. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah also there's uh, no evidence and the data for the single dose vaccine, right? So how effective it is, right? The people say it's 50% or some people say 40%, right? Uh, it's, it's hard to get this number, right? I guess, as they, I guess they don't have this data. Yeah, just want to jump in quickly and add something to Yaoshan's mm -hmm. really good comment that Eugenio and Mona could probably, uh, mm -hmm. uh, or will definitely have no more insight than I will. Um, and that is as you gather all this other data about people with different sensors and so on um, during the clinical trial, um, we have the ability to understand the conditions, the pre existing conditions about people that we otherwise don't typically monitor in those trials um, to the extent that we could if they're just wearing those sensors and so on. And so there's, I think, potential to better understand. The interplay between those factors and say vaccine efficacy or um, whatever it is that we're trying to study um, but i'll leave it to eugenio and mona to give their more insightful comments on that specifically i just see that the potential for improving our understanding of those interactions exists maybe i could start uh so no i think you're absolutely correct uh there is definitely a role for wearables and, and you know, Eugenio, I, here it is, I am actually wearing an Apple watch and it can, it has an FDA cleared algorithm to tell me if I have a fib or not. So, but you can imagine using such wearables and such new technology to be able to collect uh, adverse data, you know, after vaccination to collect the real world evidence uh, as, as you know, the, the drug development and, and Dr. Chen, correct me if I'm wrong, but that doesn't stop. 
for the time the, the 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 moment you actually distribute the drug and people use it you know you have to continue studying it afterwards to 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 you know to look at side effects to look at the efficacy um so no you, you're right there, there is there is a lot a big role for that i just want to go back to one thing that dr chen said you know i i love what you said about having to educate the policy makers so that they understand where the science is coming from and not the adversaries but i think sometimes and you know maybe i'm i'm um treading here on on murky grounds but even if they you know I, I think there's something beyond just understanding i think sometimes the incentives don't align between you know what what the government or what businesses want and what what science says so even if they understand it they might not listen to it i just want to say that yeah Mm -hmm. Yeah, they have to balance about the uh, economy and also the, the health, right? Like, I think that's uh, the trade-off between that too, yeah. And also, I think for the vaccine, also people talk about uh, using, reduce the dose, right? They'd say half dose, right? Also, not just the, the one shot, they also talk about the half dose, right? So so that they can have uh, more people get uh, vaccine, vaccinated, right? So, so Yoshin, do, do, do you have uh, any comments on that? Uh, two comments. I think why well, I want to respond a little bit to the questions about the follow-up studies. So once a vaccine is approved, yes, I think at the time, once it's approved, the medical device is so helpful. NI technique is so helpful to do this, what we call post-licensure studies. That's usually we don't call them clinical studies in the traditional sense. We call them real world effectiveness studies or real world safety monetary studies. So that at that point, I think AI and data scientists has been tremendously helpful. That I fully agree. And Guan, your questions regarding this half dose, one dose, delay second dose, these are public health policy concerns, but this in the normal days will never be feasible. It's only because it's a pandemic situation where outweighing, outweighing different kind of interests and also outweighing different kinds of objective, policy maker decided to take actions as a result of their own um, evaluations. But this is what we always call off-label use. We do not recommend that. It's very dangerous because we are taking human being as, a, as, as becoming a testing without rigorous following up the consequence of this so-called off-label use. And in the midst of the so-called vaccine hesitancy, this will only, this sometimes will generate unnecessary pushback um, something that on, on vaccine, such instrument can really save life in a tremendous way. So if you look at what happened in France right now, this is an example of why one would discourage so-called off-label use, because if there's an adverse outcome from vaccinations, it could be through different kind of platform. It could generate a lot of bias against a life-saving device. So we do not encourage off-label use. And it's not because the interest of a you know, pharmaceutical industry, it is, it is just vaccine itself is so complicated than what we normally understand about drugs and medical device. It's in a very complicated policy and social context environment. Yes. And if, I, if I can just add to that, sure. I, I think that's very well put. You know, a lot of these these vaccines came to market really fast, and and they they have certain efficacy numbers, and and they've been tested on certain things, and and. If, if, you know, for off-label use, we use that, we take medications and use them for something else. But these are for medications that have been there for a long time, that we've seen, you know, what the, what the side effect profile over years and years. This is something new and, and you are just taking it and, and changing the parameters and changing the way it should be administered and the period between administration you don't have enough information to know that that is safe. You know, for when, when, when you have limited data to bring something to market, I would think that you wanna follow exactly the rules that allowed it to be approved. What, what didn't you say that? Uh, yeah, I totally agree with Mona. 
but the exact but the the, the way policymakers policy maker for public health sometimes different from policy maker for approval and if you see the way society work now in the pandemic situation we will get to see it's not lack of the technologies it's actually the lack of coordination of different disciplinary as our panelists here we actually can talk each other reasonably to understand where we come from what is important but somehow in the society level when this important decision making process is made the coordination just miss is missing in my opinion but it's just my opinion <laughs> yeah mm. yes mm -hmm. I agree. Yeah. Okay. So let's uh, look at uh, the uh, the audience questions. So there's uh, another one. So the person ask, how do we address the issue of bias in data? This bias in AI, and what level of uh, transparency should be available to the end user or consumer in the era of AI? Maybe you handle. You are the AI guy, right? <laughs> Oh, I guess everybody is, but yeah, I can, yes, I can give it a stab. Um, so I think, um, uh, yeah, the, we definitely have a lot of problems of, of bias because a lot of uh, these AI algorithm at the end of the day, they rely on data. And then the data itself, uh, although some people don't agree on this, but the data itself uh, as some some bias, it could be just, for example, that you have uh, minority groups that uh, they're less represented than than other groups, right? And then eventually, um, you create an algorithm that uh, definitely you don't want this algorithm to be evil or do anything wrong. But, bam, you know, it happens that uh, because of the data or the ways things are structured, that that you may um uh, give the disadvantage to to some of these minorities just because maybe the data is different right maybe the data for a group of people is different from the data from another group of people and then you end up uh, recommending to minorities something different from to another group of people and it's just because of the rest of the data that you have on them or the or just the fact that they're they have you know di different kind of uh, lifestyles or other or any or other things. So I would say I have a feeling that I will see a lot of these issues coming up. And um, in part, I think it has to, I guess, you know, until we have some pretty good automatic tools that can spot these things, I think uh, probably uh, individual uh, data scientists should be assigned to to look at, um, look at bias. And I think it's important, especially in, in a lot of companies to uh, to have a good uh, team um, uh, that is looking at uh, um, at these issues, uh, try to mitigate them as soon as possible. And I, I have a feeling that um, uh, some of these issues are going to keep coming up because uh, uh, just just because, um, like I said, you know, the algorithm are in, imperfect. And even though some people say, "Hey, it's just an algorithm; it's just math," um, but combined with the data, it uh, it doesn't work the way you want it for everybody. So uh, it, I think, I, I don't know if I really have a solution for this really. <laughs> it's just, I think, at, 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 unfortunately at the moment, I, I, I bet it's just a question of uh, uh, trying to assess every case. And then whenever you create some policies or whenever this algorithm creates some policies, I think I would, it's very important to plot them across all different groups, minority or majority groups and see, you know, is there really a difference? And sometimes you, you won't be able to tell and, and it'll be too late. Um, yeah, Maybe I just want to I jump in on that. Oh, oh, yeah, okay. Sorry, I'll, I'll just jump in and make a quick comment, sorry, and then you could jump in because you're, you're more <laughs> numbers than I would. But I just want to agree a lot with what Eugenio was saying that the machine learning tools are meant to learn patterns in data. And so they're going to learn how the data, how the world is, not necessarily how it should be or how we want it to be. And that's where that bias comes in. and. Uh, how to gather more data and stuff that's more up to Toya's alley. So I'll leave it to her, but I just wanted to reiterate that, um, yeah, there's that question that, again, the, what machine learning is doing fundamentally, um, some people are aware and some people are not. So I just wanted to make a second it because I think it's really important uh, point that uh, was brought up, so. Okay. Yeah. Oh, Mona, I think you wanted to go to. Sure, 
Sure. No, no, or, no, yeah. Ahead, Toya. Okay, so um, bias normally is coming from two different, one of two areas, right? So um, as was mentioned, it could be that your sample size or whatever sample you have is not balanced and it's not representative. And so you end up with these really biased results, right? Um, or there's an aspect where there just is bias within um, whatever decisions were made, right? Like people often use the aspect of admissions, right? So if you're using like, oh, we normally take this specific candidate and use them to, um, and who's normally admitted, right? You are incorporating the bias of, you know, whatever the admissions office is, right? Into that outcome, right? So, so um, there are, um, lots of uh, statisticians and people within ML uh, researchers are really looking at different methods to uh, really figure out one, how to make sure where the bias is coming from and two, how to check for it, right? And some of the ways are checking, you can just see, you know, like, oh, is race really this driver of this result, right? Or is it really these other types of characteristics? And then you also have to take into account, oh, well, we have this characteristic, but this characteristic is really representative of, is, you know, confounded with something else, right? So, um, and how do you start to tease those apart, right? And so this is where it gets really complicated, right? And this is where we need a lot of people looking into that work of, you know, what, um, because people will suggest other, like, one of the suggestions has been, you know, why don't we remove race entirely from, you know, from one of our covariates or for our analysis, right? But then we'll incorporate something else, right? Like zip code or some other indicator that really is a, like, you know, can indicate some, is bringing in still that race component, right? So, so it becomes really complicated in, in ways to figure this out. When we talk about um, transparency, I think for, I think it depends on kind of what we're using this algorithm for, right? I think if we're doing something like ads, you know, on Twitter or Facebook, like maybe we don't care so much, right? But if we're, Again, um, as was mentioned, if we're doing things for medical decisions or we're doing things for policy decisions or we're doing things for justice decisions, you know, the big known, um, uh, the really popular example, right, of when they try to use, you know, ML to predict if they should let someone go home or, you know, keep them, um, give them bail or not, right, those type of things, then we really should be incredibly careful. And I think those things should be transparent and they should be in at least at the level of transparency that we do in academia in which you anyone can replicate what you've done and um and then test it right so um that i mean that's my two cents regarding you know kind of what's happening and bias how can we really um address it and um and a portion of that is yes, we just need to be, you know, more careful and continue to develop tools. But this is definitely being addressed, and there are definitely already methods that are out where you can compare um, results with or without race, or with or without income, or whatever you're trying to um, look at within um, within this bias to assess bias um, within your data. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Very good time. So, Mona, do you want to add on some? Uh, no, I think these are all great points. You know, as, as Toya said, there are two sources of bias. There is the, the bias that's already baked on society and that machine learning and AI reflects when you develop these models. And there is a bias of the lack of diversity in the data. You know, you're studying a, a disease on one certain population and trying to um, take the learnings and apply them to a completely separate population. Uh, so for, for the second one, it's almost easier to take that bias away. It just increase your data samples, get more diverse data. Federated learning, you know, I'm just going to put a blog for it again here. That is one way to allow you to get data from all over uh, the globe and, and, and take some of these population differences away. But for both kind of biases, you know, what Toya said, replicate and test. It's like you can't just put an algorithm out there and say, you know, this performed great. This is my AUC and we're going to start using it. You don't do that when you develop a drug. You go and and and, and do clinical trials and, and prove that it works. And so you have to do the same thing with AI algorithms. Just because I developed a neural network that gives me a certain prediction doesn't mean I have to jump and use it. This has to be validated in real life. Um, you have to validate it and then you have to continue learning and add, add more data to it as, as you learn new things. And you also have to implement specific tests to look for bias, to test for it, so that you're seeing it, to flag it when it happens, so that you can go back to the drawing table and retrain your algorithm. Yeah, exactly. So 
So Yaoshuan, from the clinical trial perspective and the, for the vaccine study, how do you uh, address this uh, bias the data issue? <laughs> when, when Mona says, when we don't have data, we just get it. I was <laughs> actually thinking that's actually not uh, not working in vaccine because we usually don't get the minority data from in the vaccine trial because they have very high vaccine hesitancy. And so in terms of recruiting the patient, now we know, we kind of learned that COVID-19, for, ex for example, is affecting the minority, especially racial minority the most. And yet in the pharmaceutical company and government put so much effort to ensure they are included in a clinical trial design, but they are just reluctant to be put, they, they are reluctant to be on board with any clinical trial design. We just couldn't get their data. And that actually is to some degree hamper the conclusion of certain clinical trial because we couldn't get their data. So this kind of bias, I think aware of it, may not have a solution of it, but aware of it, recognize it, put it as a limit, may be a first safe step to go. And it also increased the transparency of knowledge that we acknowledge that's a limit and we did our best to get their data but we somehow, we have a long, still a long way to go to achieve that goal. Yep. Yeah. Yeah, yeah I just wanna add as well, if we um, do have these kind of more elaborate models of the population and so on, when potential policies or machine learning um, implied policies or suggested policies as well um, come up, uh, we, again, if we have these good simulation models of what the population looks like, there's a potential to use them to see if there are potential uh, things that we didn't think of um, that are impacting people in a way that we wouldn't have otherwise thought, um, either from the data or just we were just were not aware of it because of our own kind of blinders on because of uh, environments that we each um, kind of are accustomed to. And so it kind of wraps around the whole system where we have the data gathering, the machine learning for policies and so on integrated with individual makers, uh, decision makers. And then we could potentially, if we have the um, sophisticated enough tools um, on the simulation side to represent a population. We have a potential test bed um, to evaluate, um, hopefully at least to catch uh, potential policies that would have these effects that we didn't think of as well. So um, I do think there's a lot of opportunity in that um, domain. And then of course you can just keep wrapping this around again. Um, well, let's learn from the simulation model and how to make the policies better and so on. Uh, we can go forever, but I think it's an interesting circle that uh, has a lot of potential in it. Um, so post market uh, vigilance, whether in AI or in drug development, that's yeah. important, right? Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Okay. So okay. So let's move on to the next question. So Brandon asks, uh, how do you know and determine uh, what data to collect, or what data could be useful? That is a good question. Who would like to address this? Well, it depends on what problem you're trying to solve here, right? Mm -hmm. You, you could take the Google approach, I guess, or the Facebook approach and just gather everything. And if you find, need a use for it later, <laughs> it's there. Um, which is um, maybe in a default scenario, if we have the capacity to do so may make a lot of sense, even if uh, we then have the problem of how to figure out what data is useful on a computational side, but um, we don't have to worry about gathering it from scratch. We just have to figure out about um, realizing that we have it already, I guess. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but the get, data gathering, there's a cost associated with that, right? So it might be, uh, we can first collect a, the small number of data first, then we'll do some feature engineering to identify which feature was uh, critical, right? Well, really uh, give, provide you a lot of information, so then we, we can prove that it's useful, then we use them, then we collect more data, right? I think that uh, if you, I mean, all this will also relate to the bias, right? If you didn't find the, the enough data or didn't find the enough uh, important features, then you're gonna create the bias, right? So, so all this is gonna relate to the previous question as well. Yeah, so I think this is uh, an interesting question because I come really from the other side of really mm -hmm. doing these retrospective studies, right? So um, 
Yes, ideally, that's what I would do my res approach. If you have the option, collect everything that you can because you never know what you'll need. But um, at least in my space, and I think this is true for a lot of people, a lot of the large data sets, right? We're not, we don't really get to choose what we collect, right? We are given some data set that exists, be it in EHR or claims data or your biometrics data. Someone else has kind of decided that. And then you go in and say, what is the, how can I get the information that I want from what is actually available um, in this data set? How can I identify my study population or whatever else? And um, so I don't really think it's flipped, right? It's more like, how can we figure out what we want to, given the data that we have? Um. Yeah, it's a challenge, yeah, I would say. Um, yeah, I say, okay, let's say, um, okay. So I think, uh, uh, yeah, so I think audience, you, you guys can post more questions. Uh, in the meantime, I think I have prepared some questions uh, maybe uh, so we can uh, talk about it. Um, I think the first question it, uh, is it, uh, what is the main obstacle in virtual clinical visits and how AI and the data science can help? So maybe uh, Tanya or Mona, you guys uh, who want to address first? Let me start with this one. Sure. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Give me some time, Tanya, to think about this. Okay. Uh, so, you know, there's obviously the very low hanging fruit, very, very easy stuff that, that, that is obstacles. You know, connectivity, do you, do you have an internet? Do you have a cellular connection? How old are you and how familiar are you with using technology? You know, are, are you able to join a Zoom call or a WebEx or a Microsoft Teams or all of the above? You know, all of that plays a big part in, in making that successful. And then, you know, depending on what kind of visit, you know, is a physician able to get the info or the nurse able to get the information that they need from, from the patient? Is there a way to send them wearables in advance to be able to, you know, to, to measure the oxygen, uh, oxygenation or, or to, you know, even today we have things where, uh, you know, physicians actually, they just got uh, FDA emergency use authorization to be able to do ultrasound over a televisit. So you send the probe to the patient and you tell the patient, oh, press over here and move it over there so that you can see the images. So, so the, you know, technology is, is making that stuff easier. Uh, the ability to, you know, you know I, I don't know, a, a year ago, you probably couldn't have a Zoom visit with, with 100 people with all the videos are all on, but, but today you are because there's certain ways of making it, um, you know, com com compressing the, the video stream. Uh, so there, there are ways to, to, to make this the platform easier to use for, for the patient and, and physician. I, I think that's the first obstacles that I see. Uh, the other obstacle is, uh, you know, depending how many, how many patients you get to see and, and you, you're having, you know, in, in, a, in a clinic visit, you, you have certain time where you see patients and then you have times to collect your thoughts and, and you know, write what happened and, and write your progress note. And uh, I could imagine a physician seeing patients one after the other and not having time to do that, but technology can help here. You can have, it can transcribe and summarize uh, the visit. Uh, it can also, you know, provide a summary to the patient. You know, the patient might forget to ask all these questions and now they have a summary of everything that transcribed, uh, that, that happened and uh, transpired, I should say. And they can go back and look at it and, and they can show it to their daughter and say, oh, well, this is what the doctor said, but I didn't understand, you know, can you tell me? Uh, so I, I think technology is, is helping in, in all of that and helping remove these obstacles. Yes, okay. okay. Yeah. Yeah, there's also oh, yeah. a cool thing that jumped in my mind too sure. when you were talking, Mona, and that's the um, ability to do automatic translation. So you can talk with a doctor with a different language as well, who may be a, a exactly. really expert exactly. in something and just increase overall accessibility. Um, and I think that that's a really cool area as well. That's exactly, that translations are happening real time. Captioning is happening real time. We actually have, we just, uh, we're releasing a feature where you know how when you, we're looking now at, at each other in Zoom and depending where you're looking, your eyes look like you're looking somewhere else. You know, there's now a AI that can redirect, uh, you know, so that every time you, whatever you're looking, it looks like you're looking at a camera and looking at all of you now, uh, but, but that's AI doing it. Uh, now, I don't have that feature on, so <laughs> it's not working, but I'm just saying that there's a lot that, that can make this experience more like the real experience. Mm -hmm. yeah, it'd be cool if those automatic captioning tools as well could um, distill the technical 
jargon to the more kind of common person jargon that they actually understand some of those things at the exactly. next level of, uh, of those tools as well. Yep, for sure, for sure. Mm -hmm. Yes. Mm -hmm. Tonya, do you want to add on some comment? Um, so one of the biggest um, limitations for um, for virtual clinic vis uh, is actual reimbursement, right? One of the reasons um, that we've been able to see the spike during COVID is that you know CMS and insurance companies decided to start covering it, right? So, so um, that's one thing to also kind of like start with, right? Where if people aren't going to get paid, no one's gonna be able to do it, right? So um, that's a major obstacle for sure. Um, you know, what's covered and how can it be covered? Um, a lot of the, Things I was going to mention in terms of um, obstacles that come up, such as, you know, um, how do you physically, what do you do if you can't physically see a patient, if you need something physical, like in order to touch the patient. Um, and, um, but on the flip side, there's a lot of, there's a lot of opportunity for, uh, for these virtual clinic visits to help a lot with health disparities, right? Like it will help with people who have um, trouble with transportation, right? It helps with um, low, a lot of low um, income or people in rural areas. It can really help them be able to get regular access to uh, virtual care, right? Through, through virtual care. But yes, we run into issues of course with bandwidth issues and connectivity, especially in rural areas. We run into the issues as we talked about, like, you know, technology, uh, how the level of comfort of technology with um, older patients, um, even just enough um, even just enough like minutes on your phone and, or you only have one cell phone and your husband takes it out. Like there are lots of things that as I've been speaking with clinicians, they run into with this, uh, virtual health space. Um, and it's been mostly used in mental health. And so that's where I've seen, um, have the best understanding of kind of the limitations and, um, and even just on the mental health side, they've said, oh, it's really helpful for, you know, our anxiety patients or, you know, for let's do self-development patients, but for trauma patients or really young patients or patients we do play therapy with, like all of this becomes very difficult, right? Um, so um, substance abuse patients, it often becomes really difficult. So it's, um, so I think the obstacles come up in terms of what needs to be treated and how important is that in-person component um, becomes, uh, as well as reimbursement, right? I think those are the really two big um, obstacles, for sure. Mm -hmm. It's a privacy also issue, right? So let me talk about the second one, right? So what are the challenges for AI in healthcare and how to address the privacy issue during the data acquisition process for AI in healthcare? So yeah, so Mona, do you want to talk a little bit of this? Uh, what are the challenges for AI in healthcare to address privacy issues? Well, I, I, I think we've just been touching yes, yes. Uh, upon this all from, along. Yeah. It's, you know, we, yeah. have, we have HIPAA regulations that make sharing data uh, less accessible. Uh, I, I'm, I'm trying to think. Uh, You know, one thing that is happening, these, like I know we keep talking about HIPAA and we keep talking about GDPR and about mm -hmm. other things that, that make it difficult to share data. Mm -hmm. But th there was, a, I, th I read this somewhere the other day, someone just, you know, put a, they had a storefront, this is pre-COVID, and they told people, if you come in and give us your, you know, a couple of items, like your date of birth and, and how long you've been married or whatever, and just a few like information about you will pay you, I, I don't know how, you know, some amount of money. And the amount of people that were willing to go in and just give their information just for, for, for little money. Uh, you can imagine that there's actually a lot of populations that have bigger incentives than being paid to share their data. You know, there are people that belong to a group uh, or a social support group of, of very rare diseases. And these people are dying to have medications that, are, that, you know, that, that can help them. So they are willing to put their data out there for research. And technology now is enabling people to actually opt in to create, you know, to be able to share the data for research. So maybe Dr. Chen, that's where you get some of your data at some point, uh, but, you know, so privacy is a barrier, but I, I think depending of, on, on the situation and the specific problem, um, there's ways to, to get around it. I, I don't know if I really got to the, 
Maybe mm-hmm. Toya, you can answer this more to the oh. spirit of the question. <laughs> Well, a lot of my points with privacy, I already kind of mentioned earlier, but um, on to kind of add to uh, Mona's point on people being paid, I think, um, like, I've definitely read some stuff where that um, it, uh, privacy is going to end up becoming a luxury service that lower income people just may not be able to afford. And I think that is that, um, I think that's a major challenge, right? Like how do we protect, you know, um, how do we not use, how does privacy not become this new thing where like, you know, poor people are just selling their data or their privacy um, in order for whatever, either free medical care or whatever else. And it's just another layer of exploitation. Um, and I think that's something we need to be um, careful of. And that's a potential challenge. Um, that's a great um, point, actually. I haven't thought about that. That's an amazing point, Victoria. That's- yeah. Um, just to jump in as well, and maybe uh, Eugenio can talk about the feasibility of this, but um, is it a loophole, so uh, Toya and Momona may know this, um, to the HIPAA regulations to create an, uh, an avatar for everybody, essentially, that learns their personal data that, in a way that is not specifically saying their birth date or something, but can represent them medically, um, that can then be put in a kind of a cyber world um, and be used in that sense, kind of like a proxy mm-hmm. for you, um, again, in a way that hopefully doesn't have specific de-anonymizing information, but is medically representative. But like then a digital write... twin of sorts. Yeah, exactly. Um, yeah. I, again, I'm just just a random idea. I'm not a yeah. special by any means. I, in this area. I guess you run into the same problem, right? That we were saying before, right? Like at some point, right? Like if someone was like, "Oh, I know a professor at Purdue in industrial engineering who like." I don't know, some random other characteristic about me, it's going to be very easy to identify who I am, right? So you run into those issues. Like even when you work with uh, claims data, you often need to aggregate it up, right? Because if it's one or two people, someone can probably figure out who you are. So so that's where it becomes difficult, where um, you can pull out this information, but eventually you have enough information where you pretty much know who the person is. I see, I see what you're saying. I was, again, I'm not by any means an expert. Oh, yeah. No, no. Yeah, I was just. <laughs> no, there are good points. I was just kind of curious. Maybe some, you don't need all of that data, like you were saying. Like, maybe you don't need to know somebody's a, a professor at Purdue or any other location specifically to be medically representative. And so I was kind of thinking some subset of data, does it exist that's medically representative that is not de-anonymizing as a kind of fundamental you know, Yeah. Maybe Eugenio can can. Uh, they mark more on this, but but there is you know this new new models that are being used to generate synthetic data, right? To generate synthetic medical records and synthetic claims data. There's data sets out there that are completely synthetic that were trained on real data initially. Maybe that's where we go with, with you know with GANs and and other uh, ways of creating data for, that that is not it cannot be traced back to a certain person. I, I don't know, Eugenio, if you have anything else to add on that. No, yeah, I, uh, I think you, yeah, you're right. I think it could, something could be done like that. I'm, I just, uh, I'm not, I'm not sure um, how we would deviate from from real data. So I would have some concern, maybe, but uh, yeah, it's. Uh, you just have a great it's a discriminator. Good it's a good idea. I haven't. I hadn't thought about it before, for sure. <laughs> yeah. Well, I, I know that there's some companies working on that. Some some institutions that are already s- starting to do that. Uh, so, I, yeah, I, just I don't to, know. If... Yeah, just like you can generate uh, like uh, fake faces that are really super real, and um, but yeah, I mean, I would be, I, yeah, honestly, I probably would be worried. I, I don't know. Yeah, I guess you would have to see if this data actually, you know, you can prove that it has the same quality as, as the original one. But I, I think you can, yeah, you can still collect data. So, you know, I think we're all afraid because uh, sometimes we see uh, that you can um, actually identify people from the data. But I think if you take some some precaution um, for for some things, it might it might be hard, right? I mean, it's one thing is to have a location data that really puts you somewhere, and then you know you can really find your house really easily, <laughs> or your or where you work. But um, and I think medical some medical data maybe people are just too too worried for uh, for 
you know, not for the right reason, I guess. It's, um, I, I think some of these data can, can be anonymized, especially if you like separate it maybe, because not, you don't need uh, maybe like a complete uh, digital twin, you know, digital twin of your, for all your medical records sometimes. Sometimes it's good to have, but uh, for maybe there's only parts of it that you can collect. And, um, and regardless, I would think if, you know, if I, if I had like a medical record of, uh, you know, the, uh, I don't know, five or six uh, major disease I had over the last 20 years, let's say, or major operation, I would think it would be hard to trace it back to me unless there's some yeah, there's some location data or there's something else. Uh, um, but yeah, I... No, yeah, I, I agree I, with you, uh, Genio. I, I think sometimes I we... <laughs> yeah. Sometimes we, we blow it out of proportion. Like, like at some point, if someone, if you know, I have a CT scan of my brain somewhere, and 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 my name is, is removed and my date of birth is removed and and someone is able to go back and reconstruct that that CT scan of my brain. Does it matter to me personally? It doesn't. <laughs> like, is there someone out there that's gonna go and say we're gonna go look at every patient and go and figure out if they had a tumor that they didn't tell us about because we're gonna go into this one model that used their data. I, I think it's a little bit far-fetched and like in conspiracy theories is like this tracing back of the data but yeah oh sorry go no 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 that's it oh no so yeah so i think there is i think in general as a society we're going to have to accept some level of risk right i think the benefits do outweigh the cons right of some you know loose-ish like privacy rules right that being um, that being said, right, like I, in reality, most people, as you bring up in your example, aren't, aren't necessarily care about um, your privacy specifically. And what I mean by that is like, nobody really cares. I don't care if you have my social security number. I care that you are you, what you use it for, right? I care that you can use that for a negative purpose, right? And so, um, that's really maybe where we should focus, right? Except that there's going to be some level of sharing, right? But how do we protect people in, in that way, right? Like how do we make, you know, researchers have access, but make these really, you know, restricted use or something like that so that we know that, you know, there isn't going to be this, um, it's not going to be sold to like your insurance company and used, you know, to calculate your premium or something, which is what people always use as the most fearful thing around, you um, around, you know, like EHRs and stuff being shared. Uh, I think that's pretty much how we are going to have to address it in the future. Yeah, I think there's also a point, um, and Yaoshin mentioned this earlier in the pandemic context about educating people in terms of what, what data is gathered. So some transparency as well and how it could potentially be used and, and that more towards that intention of what could be used in the future, what's currently being used now and to help them understand really what the world is like versus the conspiracy theories or the far, far-fetched things that even if they are created is probably so far into the future that it wouldn't matter because they're probably not going to be around anymore because it's a hundred years or something down the line. Um, and, and so I think there's an opportunity, uh, you know, being back since we're at an educational institution to um, infuse that into um, how we, at least from the student perspective, how we educate the ones that are here um, to exist in that kind of a world and be aware of those things. Exactly, yeah. I think that, yeah. I think, uh, yeah, okay. So the last question, okay, for due to the time limit. So the last question will be uh, how to take it on your HPC to get AI at scale for health care. So Johanna, can you help on this? Yeah, definitely. And it, it's possible we can take even another question because I think, you know, in terms sure. of, um, what we can, yeah, what we can do in, in terms of um, what we need to analyze data, I think it's uh, the same sure. that we need for, mm -hmm. for a yeah. lot of, uh, I, I don't really see it much of a difference. It's probably just the same kind of uh, uh, clusters uh, or um, uh, GPU or, uh, the, uh, you know, DLA, uh, deep learning accelerator clusters that, um, that we have available. I don't mm -hmm. really see Okay. Any difference between yeah this application or any other one? 
Yeah, I think more important is uh, the, 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 the next question is how to build the trust words, right? How do you build the trust? I think that might be a more important question in particular for the healthcare, right? So do you like uh, uh, like uh, to trust a robot, right? To make a decision for, to, to say, right? Whether you, right, how healthy you are, right? How do you trust that, right? So I think that might be a, a challenge question. Mm -hmm. Yeah, even but, we, yeah. Go ahead, Mona. No, I was just gonna say that goes back to the same issue of transparency and you know showing mm -hmm. people what this model is doing and how it was trained and why and and mm -hmm. and reassessing it all the time and validating it and doing trials on it, you know, validation trials and and getting someone to say, yeah, yes, this specific piece works. You know, having a model that uh, this generalized concept of an AI or a robot that's going to treat us from A to Z, I, I think that's a little bit far-fetched. You know, we, we I, the way I think of AI now is for specific, you know, very narrow AI tasks. Uh, and, and for those, hopefully we should, you know, we are able to tell the world how they're trained and, and and show them that they work so that they can trust them. Yeah, exactly. If, if I understood mm -hmm. that question correctly. Mm -hmm. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think part of the trust as well is to um, not just show that it's say compared to a person, um, how much more accurate or whatever is it, but also to not be afraid to show that the machine learning can go wrong. And this is the cases where it has gone wrong and the way people can understand it's not a silver bullet. Um, and it does make mistakes and maybe at a lower rate than people, but it can make mistakes and they can maybe work together in certain ways um, to overcome individuals' limitations. Um, yeah. But uh, I think there's an overemphasis when people think of machine learning or AI that it's a silver bullet and it's always right. And I think um, highlighting that it's not, um, just as people are not, um, may help in that as well. Because um, I think people are afraid of what the tool may tell them um, under the assumption it's always right as well. And I think to, uh, um, highlight that in, in better ways may be useful. Yeah, so that's answer. actually, you, you bring up an amazing point, Mario. You know, the, the other thing that we always, we're holding AI to a level that we don't hold ourselves to. It's like the AI has to be 100% correct all the time. I don't know one driver that's 100% correct, correct in all of their decisions. I think you have to take these AI models and, and, and what they're doing on the aggregate is on the aggregate, are they doing better decisions than, uh, you know, then if we didn't have them, are they giving us better results than if we didn't have them? As opposed to saying every time it's going to be right. You know, I, I think that's the standard that we don't have to hold humans to, right? Mm -hmm. Exactly. Yeah. Tanya, yeah. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah, no, this goes, yeah, to just piggyback on this, this goes back to the initial point we we're talking about bias and samples, right? Like, I'm sure everyone heard of the study where, um, in general, right, um, ML does better at predicting um, or diagnosing what's wrong with the patient uh, for a very, for common uh, conditions. But as soon as you get rare, physicians are better, right? So, so those are, so also, again, like as, as you're saying, like taking into account when it works well and when it doesn't and, you know, using those together, right? Like I think we'll, we'll be best when we use ML as a tool to support a decision by a human instead of it mm -hmm. being this one or the other. Yes, exactly. All right. Okay. So let's. Uh, here's uh, the final. I would like to thank all the panelists and the audience for joining and participating in these uh, webinars. Thank you. Bye bye. Hey, thank you so much, Dr. Oh, thank, you. thank you. This is great. Thank you. Bye. 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 -bye.